the psalmist proclaims, happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the way of the Lord. Happy are those who keep the Lord's decrees, who seek God with their whole hearts. I invite you now to stand in body or in spirit as we join our voices together in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. When we seek justice for the other, when we love kindness and share it with others, when we walk humbly through life, when we offer mercy to those who hurt, when we are willing to look foolish by following Jesus, when we choose weakness rather than power, Now let us sing together hymn number 473, For the Beauty of the Earth. may be seated. If we want to truly live in God's presence, we must live as God's faithful people. Let us begin by confessing the mistakes we have made, the wrongs we have done, the people we have hurt. Join me as we pray together saying, God of grace and mercy, you require that we do justice love kindness, and walk humbly with you. But what have we done? We have chosen corruption, discrimination, and greed over justice, cruelty and hate over kindness, prosperity and success over service, self-sufficiency and independence over right relationship with you. Forgive us when we fall into the patterns of this world rejecting your call through our action or inaction. Forgive us, God, and move us to see the world through the lens of your great love. Forgive us, God, 
and grant us hearts to open change. Amen. God forgives us of our sins. God calls us to try again. Not because we are strong, but because God will help us. God calls us as disciples. Not because we are worthy, but because we are loved. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Through the love of God in Christ Jesus, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated.
Let us pray. God of wisdom, move in our midst this day. Open our ears to hear your words of challenge and words of blessing. Open our hearts to accept the challenge and blessing you offer and to be transformed by it. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. I invite you now to listen for God's word speaking to us today. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised, what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now I'd like to invite the children forward for the children's sermon with Pastor Carrie. Good morning. Good morning. Shh. Is it right here? Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good. So I have a question for you all. How many of you know the word foolishness? What does that word mean? Shh. Okay, thank you. What does foolishness mean? What does it mean to be foolish? Anybody know? Have any ideas? Be mean. Mean? Maybe not quite mean, but you're getting close. Yeah, exactly. To act silly, right? So when we're foolish, we're kind of silly. We might be mean. Being mean can be kind of silly. But when we're foolish, we're doing things that are, that are silly, and not intelligent. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So our scripture passage that we're going to hear in just a few minutes starts off by saying the message of the cross, the message of God is foolishness. And what it means is that sometimes God asks us to do things that to the world seem silly seem foolish, but God wants us to do those things anyway. Things like putting other people first, being kind to people and thinking about other people before we think about ourselves. To some people, that seems silly, that seems foolish, but it's just exactly those kinds of things that God calls all of us to do. And we are supposed to remember that God's foolishness, when God is silly, God is still wiser than we are, wiser than any human wisdom, and God's weakness, when God is weak, God is still stronger than we ever could be. And so we're supposed to remember that and remember that even when God asks us to do things that might seem silly, that we listen to God and that we follow God because we know 
that God loves us and cares about us and wants us to be just like God is. You think you guys can remember that and help do that too? All right, let's say a prayer. Dear God, we thank you for loving us. We ask that you help us to be foolish for you. Help us to do all the things that you ask us to do. In your name we pray, amen. second scripture reading this morning is actually going to be our second and third scripture reading. Uh, you've heard Davis and I both talk about how we are lectionary preachers, the lectionary being a three-year cycle of scripture texts that pastors go to to pick what they're going to preach from. As somebody who preaches once a month, often I go to that list and I think to myself, really? This is what I have to work with this week? But this week is a joyful thing for me because there is an abundance of wonderful passages and I just couldn't pick two of them. So we're going to hear three of them. Um, so the second scripture reading uh, will be, you can find it on page 882 if you're following along. It's Matthew chapter 5 verses 1 through 12. So I invite you to listen first to this passage and then I'll read the one from 1 Corinthians. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And now from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. I invite you to listen again for God's word speaking to the church this day. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, 
But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in order to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Not long after we started dating, Hamilton and I sat down one evening so that I could introduce him to one of my all-time favorite movies, Groundhog Day. He had never seen the 1993 classic, and I was confident that he was going to love it as much as I did. Spoiler alert, and to give you an idea of where this story is headed, to this day, Hamilton refuses to watch this movie with me, so keep that in mind. For those of you that may not be familiar with the classic, the main character of the movie is Phil Connors, played by Bill Murray. Phil is a cynical and sarcastic, arrogant and egotistical weatherman for a local Philadelphia television station who has been assigned for four years running to cover the story of Puxatawney Phil, who, by the way, did see his shadow, did not see his shadow this morning, early spring. There is absolutely no effort on Phil's part to hide his frustration or his disdain for this assignment. Begrudgingly, Phil once again with his colleagues travels to Puxatawney for the report, but they become trapped there because a blizzard moves in and prevents their ability to travel home. A blizzard that Phil himself forecasted would not come. Phil becomes stuck not only in the town of Puxatawney, but also becomes stuck in the worst day of his life as he's forced to relive it again and again and again. Every morning he wakes up and it's February 2nd and each day a repeat of the one before until Phil begins to make some necessary changes. So Hamilton and I settle in to watch this movie. A friend of ours who has seen the movie is also there. She and I, having seen it before, are chatting, sort of watching, sort of not really paying attention, as Hamilton begins to watch this movie that I may have slightly oversold. <laughs> At a point, Hamilton interrupts our conversation to say that he thinks there's something wrong with the movie. It keeps repeating, he says. <laughs> We laugh, say something like, I know, isn't it great? That's the point. And return to our conversation. And for a while, Hamilton continues to watch before alerting us that no, he really does think that there's something wrong with the movie. We assured him it's what was supposed to happen, but noticing that the movie did seem to be taking longer than normal to progress, this time we began watching as well. And it wasn't long before we realized that at some point, one of us, possibly me, whose foot was closest to the remote, accidentally hit the scene chapter repeat button. <laughs> and for an undetermined amount of time, something actually really was wrong with the movie. <laughs> 
as we had been watching the same chapter and the same few scenes over and over and over again. It was Hamilton's very own Groundhog Day. Admittedly, the movie is foolishness. But that being said, I want to come back to Phil. As the movie unfolds, seemingly real and meaningful transformation does happen in his life. It is no doubt a movie, but the change that takes place in him is also realistic, I think. At first, it is slow, begrudging, almost non-existent. At first, bitter and angry, Phil uses his newfound fate to gorge himself on sweets and treats, that things like calories and cholesterol tell the rest of us that these are things we should avoid, but he throws caution to the wind. He moves on to more self-centered behavior, like stealing money out of an armored truck, fixing things or saving people, learning how to play the piano, only to impress the girl or gain popularity and notoriety from the townspeople. But slowly, very slowly, change does begin to happen. Eventually, it becomes obvious that it's not just his actions, but his motivations that are beginning to change and to be transformed. Obviously, I have lost Hamilton on this one, but maybe I can convince y'all you see, what I really love about this movie is how it presents each day as a kind of foolishness. How from the outside looking in, what's the point, we could ask? I don't notice anything different. I don't see anything different. And therefore, we tell ourselves it must not be. It must not be true. It must not be real. And yet, with the progression of time, we are able to see change that often does seem non-existent to us from day to day. With the progression of time, we are often reminded of what matters and what doesn't. We're reminded of what is real and what is not. As familiar and as well known as these passages of scripture that have been read this morning are, I think they can often be unapproachable for us at times. Certainly, these are passages and words that we aspire to. Of course, those are the things that we want to do. But they are, too, things that are difficult to live out, difficult to embody, goals sometimes that we are unable to achieve, especially if and when we view our progress from day to day. As people of faith, we are called to ask ourselves, what does it mean to live lives and to live as community shaped by the wisdom of the cross, shaped by foolishness? And we are right to laugh at the oxymoron that is wisdom and cross. It is foolishness after all. Paul knew the difficulty of belief in a God who seemed foolish for those that were listening to him speak. Belief in a God whose ways just didn't make sense when viewed through the lens of the world. Paul knew that no one can make sense of death in such a senseless way. No one except God. As we consider what it means to be shaped by foolishness, I'm reminded of Henry Nouwen's distinction between optimism and hope. Nouwen says that these are radically different attitudes. Optimism is the expectation that things like the weather, human relationships, the economy, the political situation will get better. Hope, however, according to Nouwen, is the trust that God will fulfill God's promises to us in a way that leads to true freedom. The optimist speaks about concrete changes in the future. The person of hope lives in the moment 
regardless of what is going on or taking place, with the knowledge and trust that all of life is in good hands, God's good hands. It's how Jesus is able to say things like, blessed are those who mourn, those who hunger and thirst, those who are persecuted and mean it. It's how we're able to say it too, how we're able to continue to work for, strive for, live into God's kingdom, even when the world tells us that it doesn't exist, even when we have a hard time seeing it ourselves. Living as people of faith, people who believe in the fulfillment of God's kingdom here and now, people who hope, is foolishness. Living as those who strive to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly, faithfully, intentionally with God, foolishness. Believing that those among us who are poor in spirit, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger and thirst for righteousness, who are merciful, who are peacemakers, who are persecuted, who are reviled, believing and living as though these folks are blessed, are enviable, are a model of who we should be, is foolishness. Regardless of circumstances, choosing to live in the moment with the knowledge and trust that all of life is in good hands, God's good hands, is foolishness. Week after week, year after year, bringing canned goods to a red barrel, foolishness. Taking meals to good news at noon, foolishness. Coming to worship, Sunday school classes, Bible studies, circles, foolishness. Sewing dresses and pillowcases for children in hospitals, children halfway around the world, foolishness. Preparing food for a friend in need or a friend who mourns, foolishness. Anytime. We raise our voices, lend a hand, participate, even and especially when we know it isn't meant for us, but for the betterment of another person, for the betterment of the community or the common good. It is foolishness. God's wisdom often looks like foolishness. And may we all have the courage to make fools of ourselves for the sake of love and the sake of God's kingdom here and now. Amen. Friends, having heard the word proclaimed, I want to invite you now to stand as you are able and join with me in affirming our faith together using the words of one of the most ancient creeds of our church, the Apostles' Creed. Let us say together what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you now to join with me in hymn number 386, O oh for a World.
You may be seated. We have been called to live lives marked by justice, love, and truth, and we have been blessed to be a blessing. Let us generously offer all that we are and all that we have to further God's kingdom of love and justice, truth and blessing, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the kingdom of God. Let us now give back to God. Let us pray. Holy God, you bless us in so many areas of our lives, in places we often fail to recognize as blessing. Help us have eyes to see and hearts to understand the depth of your love and blessing. Today we give out of that blessedness, dedicating ourselves to lives of justice and love, mercy and kindness giving all that we are and all that we have to bring about your kingdom here and now. In the name of your son, we pray. 
Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. They shall come from east and west, north and south, and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. It is not a Presbyterian table or even a table that belongs to this congregation. It is the Lord's. And our Savior invites all who trust in him to come and share the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to praise you, O God, creator of the universe. In your wisdom, you made all things and sustained them by your power. You transformed, you formed us in your image to love and serve you and to live in peace with your creation. When we rebelled against you, you did not abandon us, but sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then in the fullness of time, you sent your only son to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with choirs of angels and with all your faithful people of every time and place, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. God, we thank you for Jesus Christ, your Son. In Jesus, born of Mary, your word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. He lived as one of us, knowing joy and sorrow. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, welcomed sinners, and proclaimed good news to the poor. Dying on the cross, he gave himself for the life of the world. Rising from the grave, he won for us victory over death. Seated at your right hand, he reigns with you in glory and will come again to make all things new. Remembering the risen Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this juice as we live for the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer you now the sacrifice of our lives so let us proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and cup that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ and with all who share this feast united in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. In union with your church in heaven and on earth, we pray, O oh God, that you will fulfill your eternal purpose in us and in all the world. Keep us faithful in your service until Christ comes in final victory 
and we shall feast with all your saints in the joy of your eternal realm. We pray in the name of Christ, using the prayer that he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that he was betrayed, our Savior took a loaf of bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he also took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. For every time that we eat this bread, we drink from this cup. We proclaim the Lord's saving death until he comes again. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
friends, please join with me in the prayer printed on the insert in your bulletin. Loving God, we thank you that we have fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet in your eternal realm. Send us out by the power of your spirit to live and work in your praise and glory. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we sing together our final hymn of the morning, hymn number 371, Lift High the Cross. As always, our invitation is twofold. For those of you that are visiting with us this day, we invite you to consider joining with us as members here at Buford Presbyterian Church as we seek to be the people of God in this part of God's kingdom. For those of you that are longtime members, I invite you to consider that God is still working and moving in your life, calling you to all sorts of foolishness. So we invite you to talk to either Davis or I or to each other about what it is that you see God doing in your life and in this place. Friends, as we go from here this day, we are reminded that the message of the cross, the message of God is foolishness. The call of God is foolishness and yet we are called to go anyway, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. And as we go, we know that the God of hope fills us with all joy and peace in believing that we might abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit now and forever. 
Amen.